An artistic maverick still going strong at 95. Imagine profiles Louise Bourgeois in half an arm, BBC One Northern Ireland, after this week's spotlights. The programme contains scenes which some viewers may find disturbing. Quinn was only 21 when he was beaten to death by a masked gang. I think he was expecting, you know, a, somebody to come up and hit him or something like that. There, but I don't think he expected what he was, what he got. Like Paul was killed because. Uh, he got into the fight with a couple of different people about the area and he was killed because of that, to beat him, to beat him up and beat him to death. If the RA was involved, it could threaten the peace process. There is evidence that some of the individuals involved in the murder have connections to the IRA, in some cases family connections. Now that's a matter of concern to us. I have been speaking to people who are involved in the IRA on the ground there. They're saying they aren't involved in it. They say that they are convinced that none of their members uh, were involved in this incident uh, and they are not aware of who was responsible for it. I don't know how the people that done it can go to bed at night because I can't get up in the mornings to face the day. Just over three weeks ago, Paul Quinn from Cully Hanna in South Armagh was lured here, and he was beaten to death by masked men wielding iron bars. His family blame the IRA, and Sinn Féin strongly deny this. If his murder was sanctioned by the IRA, that has serious implications for the peace process. So on tonight's Spotlight, we ask, who killed Paul Quinn? On the afternoon of Saturday the 20th of October, according to a first-hand account given to Spotlight, Paul Quinn got a call from two friends asking him to help them clear a barn just over the border near Castle Blaney to make room for cattle. Unknown to Paul, a gang had already taken his two friends hostage and forced one of them to call him, drawing Paul into a deadly trap. Paul Quinn decided to spread the work and enlisted the help of a friend. That afternoon, Paul and his friend drove along this road, just over the border and to this barn. They got out of the car, they saw nothing suspicious, and they made their way down here to the back of the barn. The gang moved in quickly, surrounding Paul and his friend and beating them to the ground. His friend was dragged off to another part of the barn where the other victims were being held. According to our first-hand account, it was clear who the gang were really interested in. After separating Paul Quinn from his friends, the men systematically and savagely beat him with iron bars. As they did, they delivered a chilling message. We're the bosses round here. Paul Quinn's friends could hear his screams. Even after the screams stopped and Paul went quiet, the beating continued. As the men prepared to leave, the boys heard them spraying something on the ground. The victim's phones were smashed and they were warned not to move for half an hour. The gang then left in a van they had hidden in the barn. But one of the victims was able to use his phone to call Paul's girlfriend, Emma, who lived nearby. 
I was at home on the computer and I was texting Paul and then next thing his friend rang me and said that would tell me to ring an ambulance and I was there, what do you want me to ring an ambulance for? And said just ring an ambulance and when I hung up the phone I rang the ambulance and then I got into the car and went on down the road. I thought at first, you know, that he got his knees blow, blown off or something because there was like blood all around his knees or whatever and I think it was bone sticking out of his leg. He was just all completely battered, like he wasn't fit to move for anything. You wouldn't even expect a dog to be battered the way he was battered. At this point, Paul was struggling to remain conscious. He wanted to go home and I told him that I couldn't take him home. And um, he just, I, I told him there was an ambulance coming and he kept saying, when's the ambulance coming? But he couldn't even say it. He couldn't even talk the way I'm talking. He was kept mumbling and all because he was in that much pain. He couldn't even talk right. When the ambulance arrived, he was taken to hospital in Drogheda. I thought he was, you know, I thought like he just got a beating, like he had broken legs and then he was going to be all right in a few weeks. like. Paul's parents had been told what had happened and were on their way to the hospital. On our way up to Drahoe, we got another phone call to say that he, he had to get some sort of tube down his throat to breathe for him, that he wasn't fit to breathe for himself, and I knew at that stage that he was in serious trouble, you know. Paul's injuries were horrific. He had multiple broken bones and severe internal injuries. We were taken in a room, a small room, and we were told there, were, there was a medical team working on him and doing their best, and they were still working on him, but... And I guess the doctor... Did he... Was, would he survive? And he said, no, I don't think so. Yeah, he, he was dead at that stage that he was... But they were trying to revive him. And he, they tried it for an hour, I think. It was no good. He was that bad they couldn't. Paul Quinn died around 8 o'clock that night. Geraldine Donnelly, a friend of the family and SDLP counsellor, went straight to the hospital. Breach um, came over and... Um, she cried on my shoulder and she basically said, um, they've, mur they've murdered my son. And um, she said, you should see his body in there, it's broken. It's, it's all broken up. And she said, um, he was crying and there was nobody there, nobody to help him. It was, it was terrible. As a parent myself, I just put myself in that position. And I, I know exactly what you're saying and it's just, it was, it was a dreadful night. They allowed us to see Paul before they moved him to the chapel, but we weren't allowed to touch him. And that was horrendous. Paul Quinn lived at the family home just outside Cullihanna. Paul was a good lad. Very nice Easy lad. going. Easy going, all the smiling and... Telling jokes and joking mm. with you. And Trying to make a fool of you. And, yeah. And ringing you and putting yeah. on a different accent and mm. laughing well, then when you'd... <coughs> Trying to get you going and when he get you going he started to laugh at you and <laughs> away walking. That was his way of going. He was good natured. Emma Murphy had known Paul Quinn for five years they had just begun to go steady. He was funny, smart. Like he was, he'd be smart and that there were people, but that was just, you no, know, just keep the crack going, like. And he was a lovely fella, so he was. Like he'd do anything for anyone. Like if his friends wanted anything or wanted him to do anything, like he was always there for all his friends, like. Paul was a sort of very lively young lad, full of energy. Like most small lads, they're always on the go. And, um, one Sunday night or one Monday morning about three or four o'clock, he was coming home and he fell asleep at the wheel of his car. I think he drove a white Toyota. And he knocked a pillar down to the church. But his father took him back up and helped to build the pillar up. I wouldn't be awful hard on, on, on young people. and A lot of people would be like that. We were all young once and we know that none of us were saints. 
Hundreds of his friends and family turned out for his funeral. That's the feeling was tremendous shock and grief and that this awful event had taken place that shouldn't have taken place. I said that at the start of Mass, we come here in grief and we come here also in anger that this has happened. Everyone was all angry over the way it happened and they're all sad and everything because nobody wanted to see him go and no, everyone knew that he didn't deserve to go the way he did go. Paul Quinn was born and brought up in South Armagh, an IRA heartland. For three decades, it was one of the most dangerous postings in the world for the security forces. Over 150 soldiers and police officers were killed here. There were more than a thousand bomb attacks. Throughout much of South Armagh, the IRA were the law. If a house is burgled for insurance, they got that kind of a thing that the people will have to go to the, to, the, to the police. Possibly if they had no insurance, they might turn to the IRA. And even if they had insurance, they might go to the police to make the claim and turn to the IRA if they, if they had a slightest idea who might have been responsible, they might turn to the IRA for sanction against the individual. But attitudes have begun to change, following the landmark decision by Sinn Féin to support the PSNI. Does the IRA in South Armagh accept the PSNI as the law? Yes, because that was a decision taken by Republicans, taken by Sinn Féin at the Ardesh, and I think the people in the IRA supported that decision. And so they have, and part of this is, is, is part of what the tension is in South Armagh, because there are other people who are determined to pursue a criminal agenda. But Paul Quinn's family believe that he was killed by members of the IRA because some of them still think that they are the law. Within hours of Paul's murder, his family revealed their thoughts in a statement read by Jim McAllister, a former Sinn Féin councillor and longtime family friend. In essence, to say that, that their son, Paul, was regionally involved in an altercation with uh, individual members of the provisional movement. And that subsequent to this, he received uh, a threat via a third party ordering him to leave the country, and that he courageously and correctly refused uh, to obey that and insisted on staying, uh, staying in his home. And it goes on to say that they believe he was abducted and brutally beaten to death by the provisional movement. And they say that they don't intend to let this matter rest. Sinn Féin's response was immediate. There is no Republican involvement whatsoever in this man's murder. The people involved are criminals. They need to be brought to justice. And it's fairly obvious to me uh, that this is linked to fuel smuggling and to uh, criminal activity. It's a position Sinn Féin have consistently repeated. Paul Quinn was involved in smuggling and criminality, and I think, I think everyone accepts that. You know, I, I, as I say, this is a very difficult situation because there's a family grieving here, and you don't want to add to that grief by saying things about their son. Do you have any evidence, then, that Paul Quinn was killed by a criminal gang? No, I have no evidence as to who killed Paul Quinn. I have to speculate about some of the activities he was involved in. So he might have driven an odd lorry here and there for different people, but he... He was just doing it, he was getting a few pounds to drive the lorry, he wasn't smoking. It was just a day's work to him. To... Former Sinn Féin MLA and IRA prisoner Pat McNamee left the party after disagreeing with the path that Sinn Féin were taking. He is a friend of Paul's family. Paul Quinn may have been involved in oil smuggling at some time in his life. But if he was, he would only be like hundreds and hundreds of others in South Armagh who've been involved in oil smuggling over the last 5, 10, 20 and 30 years. Um, but I don't believe that oil smuggling has anything to do with his murder. A belief supported by Jim McAllister. He left Sinn Féin because he disagreed with the party's support for the PSNI. I believe he was killed by the people who still call themselves the IRA because he had the, the courage to stand up against them and he did not show the proper respect, if you like. He wouldn't, in other words, he wouldn't bow down. And it was Paul's refusal to bow down that led to fights with Republicans. 
one of them with the son of a senior IRA man, the officer commanding in South Armagh. I believe that uh, four young men in a car uh, rammed his car in the vicinity of Cullihanna village and that he gave chase and sort of cornered them and captured one of them. The other three, I think, ran. And I believe he gave him a couple of, I would say, locally slaps and perhaps a kick up the backside. The family believed that he went too far in the eyes of the IRA when he was involved in a fight with the second Republican family. At a later date, he had a, another bit of a run in with another Republican too. And they would give him a black eye or a cut eye or something. And that was really old, it was, it was still it. So I thought maybe, maybe, yeah, he maybe might have got a slap or two back at some stage or other for doing it, but did not believe in that he'd be kicked to death or battered to death for giving someone a black eye or a cut eye or something like that. And he didn't go to them with balaclava on his face. Hmm. He stood up and it took ten of them with balaclavas on them to, or maybe yeah. more. And lured him till his death uh, along. Yeah. Paul told his father he had been warned. All I know is that Paul came home here and he told me that uh, there was some sort of a warning, all right, and that's what that was all. And he thought maybe and that he might be some reoccurrence after the, having this fight with them. With tensions running high, graffiti appeared in Cullihanna threatening one of the Republican men with whom Paul had had a fight. Connor Murphy said he's spoken to the man. He feels very much under threat and he's very much aggrieved, uh, particularly by the people who have identified him publicly to journalists and to others, uh, and have, 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 have stated that his, uh, it's, he is responsible or the incident that he was involved in with this young lad is somehow the, the source of this young fellow being brutally murdered. Connor Murphy maintains that these fights with Republicans had nothing to do with Paul's murder. If it's put to us that he was uh, beaten to death because he had a, a slight altercation, which didn't result in anybody being grievously injured, with two people associated with the Republicans out of a, a whole range of altercations that he had, that this was the reason that he was beaten to death. Well, then, obviously, in defence of having spoken to Republicans and said, no, absolutely not, we were not involved in that. But questions still remain. Would the IRA really put the peace process at risk over a couple of fights with local Republicans? Some believe his attackers didn't mean to kill him, and if Paul Quinn hadn't died, it would have just been another beating in South Armagh. Do you believe they intended to murder him? I don't believe so. You believe it was just a, a beating gone wrong? Um, I believe that they intended to beat him to the extent that he would never walk again or he would never be able to, to lift his hands and defend himself again. Um, but he was beaten with such implements and with such savagery that, um, you know, um, the people who, who are responsible, you know, will have to live with that. The guards are keeping an open mind over the motive for Paul Quinn's murder. So what about the accusations that he was killed because of a fallout over diesel? The Pierce and I were investigating the theory that he had been involved in the burning of a lorry carrying illegal fuel. Number one, whatever involvement he had in it would be peripheral. You know, he wasn't a big time guy making the big time money. There's no question about that. So why would these launderers beat each other up, or smugglers of any kind beat each other up or kill each other? Pat McNamee believes the way the murder was carried out points to who was behind it. There was a number of people, a large number of people, 10 or 15 people organised, were wearing overalls, they were wearing ballot lavas, um, they abducted four people and carried this out in a well-planned and pre-organised manner. They um, also were prepared in terms of their departure and escape from the scene and the cover-up of any evidence, you know, resulting from it. 
Um, and the lead up and the manner in which it was carried out um, leads the family to believe that there is no doubt as to who was responsible. Who, who do you think was responsible? Well, I believe that members of the provisional IRA were responsible. Now, to say that the only people who can be involved in any activity in that area of the IRA is incorrect. There's quite a lot of activity goes on in that area. There's a, a very there are organised gangs who smuggle, uh, who uh, launder fuel, uh, who engage in various elements of criminal activity. Paul's father believes the message given during the beating is significant. When they were beaten, how these boys are heard. There was one of them whispering into one of the other lads they were holding, holding them down, and one of them was whispering into his ear, supposed to be, we are the bosses round here. You know who the bosses is round here now. We are the bosses round here. And that is gospel truth. To Paul's father, the bosses round here mean the local IRA. Jim McAllister believes the truth goes much further than just a local dispute. Information has come to me that uh, of a uh, high-level meeting taking place with a number of figures there, which would include the, the South Armagh OC. The man above him is a man from Drummond T, who, who would be uh, divisional reporting to the Army Council. If it goes to a senior level in the IRA, and I have no doubt this was sanctioned. Sinn Féin believe that Paul Quinn's murder is being exploited by some opposed to their strategy. I think there's a very concerted attempt to damage Sinn Féin on the ground in South Armagh. I do believe that others uh, who are responsible for that undercurrent have been manipulating the grief of the Quinn family. That is completely untrue. People have spoken for us with our permission about Paul's death. We were not manipulated by anybody. But could the death of a 21-year-old from South Armagh really have such damaging consequences for peace in Northern Ireland? Well, if the IRA were involved in the murder of Paul Quinn, then that obviously has fairly serious political implications, and we will need to consider those implications. Geoffrey Donaldson sought assurances from the Prime Minister that the Assembly wouldn't be put at risk. In light of this... Uh, killing of Paul Quinn, will the Prime Minister now reiterate that commitment from the government that only parties in default of their commitments will be sanctioned and not everyone else in Northern Ireland? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that is the position of the government. Uh, this, was, this was a brutal and horrific crime. I think that there won't be any political implications for the peace process, basically because um, senior security personnel on both sides of the border, the British government, and probably most importantly the DUP are prepared to turn a blind eye to this murder. I don't think that the Stormont executive is in any trouble. I don't think that there will be political repercussions for Sinn Féin. I think that Paul Quinn's provisional IRA killers will have got away with it. Although Sinn Féin have denied the IRA's part in this murder, the IRA have previously denied and then later admitted killing Jean McConville, Frank Kerr at Newry's sorting office and the Garda detective Jerry McCabe. Uh, there are times when the IRA have, on, on first instance, said that they weren't involved with them and they have clarified their position. Do you not think that there is a danger at some point that members of the IRA will come back and clarify their position again, as they have in the past? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's the case at all. But clearly, with so much at stake for the whole of Northern Ireland, Paul Quinn's friends fear political pressure will mean the whole story may never come out. I do have fears at this point in time that there is political pressure to keep the lid on this and to try and have it recorded as something other than what it was. In other words, not to implicate the provisional IRA and cause embarrassment to Sinn Féin and threaten the power sh sharing arrangements uh, that exist in Stormont. And what are your reactions to Sinn Féin's comments that this was an act of criminality between local gangs? Um, it's uh, a cover up and a whitewash in order to protect their vested interests in the current arrangements and their positions. I'm, there won't be any cover-up. There's nothing to cover up. Cover up or not, justice for Paul Quinn and his family may ultimately depend on the people of South Armagh. We hope and pray. Yeah. We're very, very it hopeful will. and I hope and, that, and they're caught and caught soon and put behind bars where they belong. 
has no place them sort of people in society whatsoever, in my opinion. We don't want any retaliation of any kind. We just want everybody to go to the guards and the PSNI and give them anything they know to help. Put them behind bars. The DUP insists that just because it's now sharing power with Sinn Féin, it will not turn a blind eye to the actions of the IRA. I made clear on behalf of the DUP that we would not sweep this issue under the carpet, but we would wait until we had a full and proper assessment made by the security forces as to who was responsible. The issues are serious. The difference, we're now in government, uh, and we have to consider the people of Northern Ireland. The, of the, the DUP is walking a very thin line between political maturity and hypocrisy. The DUP made David Trimble's life hell for many years when he was in government with Sinn Féin over both major and minor incidents. Um, the DUP castigated him for things like the IRA robbing a cash and carry where no one was killed. And in this case, we actually have a death. We have a, a, a young man lying in a grave and the DUP is talking about, well, was the IRA corporately responsible? That's a very fancy phrase. We never heard such phrases used by the DUP before. Yesterday, the IMC stated that it believed that both former and current members of the IRA were involved in Paul Quinn's murder, but it was too early to say whether it was sanctioned by the IRA leadership. Potential jury by my Last right. night in the House of Lords, the Ulster Unionist peer, Lord Laird, called for resolute action. The need is for both governments to deal with this type of criminal activity, brushing it onto the carpet, uh, as it seems to many to be the case, is just short term. The Under parliamentary privilege, Lord Laird had earlier named a number of people he claimed were involved in Paul Quinn's murder. Those closest to Paul are hopeful that they will get all the answers, but they are still coming to terms with their loss. It only hits me whenever I'm on my own, and normally in him I was on my own, I was texting him, and you know, he was talking with him, and it just got just hard being on my own all the time, knowing that he's just not going to be there anymore. We thought this day was gone the day of more than anybody was gone. And that's what the peace process is for. I don't know how the people that done it can go to bed at night, because I can't get up in the mornings to face the day.